Welcome to the Valhalla Personal Firearm Defense DVD Series. If you own a gun and are willing to use it to protect yourself or those you care about, then this DVD collection is as important to you as your gun itself. You'll discover the difference between shooting at paper targets and using your firearm to defend yourself against a lethal threat in a real-life situation. Your instructor is Rob Pincus, Director of Operations at the Valhalla Training Center in Colorado, one of the most highly progressive close quarters tactical facilities in the world. Each DVD in this reality-based series is an intense training session. Throughout the series, you'll witness the many aspects of personal defense with a firearm in the environments and situations in which you're likely to experience the need to react to a threat. At Valhalla, Rob trains military personnel, SWAT teams, police, private security personnel, housewives, and people like you. By using the skills and tactics you'll discover in the Valhalla Personal Firearm Defense DVD series, you'll feel confident in protecting yourself and your loved ones at all times. Rob Pincus is the Director of Operations and Lead Instructor at the Valhalla Training Center in Western Colorado. Valhalla is the most progressive close quarters tactical facility in the world using realistic training techniques and state-of-the-art technology. Rob is a former law enforcement officer, executive protection agent, and training consultant. His extensive operational and training experience allows him to help his students become more tactically efficient and effective. And through the Valhalla facility, they become better able to recognize and respond to violent threats in the real world. The information in this video is based on Rob's Combat Focus Shooting Program, which has been adopted by military personnel, defensive shooters, and law enforcement agencies around the world. Combat Focus Shooting is an intuitive shooting program designed to work well with what we know the body is going to do naturally during a dynamic critical incident. Whenever we're training, we want to raise our awareness levels so that we recognize situations faster and we can respond more intuitively respond more efficiently, respond consistently, and of course appropriately in a dynamic critical incident to stop a lethal threat to us or someone that we're trying to protect. Combat focus shooting allows us to practice in a more intuitive and natural way, working well with what we know our body's going to do. Whether we're talking about sighted fire or unsighted fire, we want to be able to recognize as quickly as we can the need for accuracy that we have in any given situation and how best to get that the most efficiently we can. Less time, less thought. I like to say combat focus shooting was recognized, it wasn't really developed. Over a number of years, in a number of different contexts, with a number of different types of students, we found that it's much easier to teach shooting intuitively and then let people increase their level of precision with mechanical target shooting type skills. What's much more important is a defensive response with a firearm in a dynamic critical incident that allows us to achieve combat accuracy. Combat accuracy is best achieved through intuitive shooting. Again. We will incorporate as much mechanics as we need to, but also as little as we have to. Combat focus shooting is the best way for you to defend yourself during a dynamic critical incident with a firearm. Combat focus shooting relies on that mechanical consistency that comes from the fundamentals. It relies on the lack of options and the lack of variations in the way you present the gun to be efficient. The goal of that efficiency, again, is combat accuracy. Any shot that significantly affects the target's ability to present a lethal threat. If you think about a variety of different scenarios in which you might be attacked and you have to defend yourself, we could envision a time when a shot to the leg would significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. We can envision a time when a shot to the arm might significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. In fact, we can even think of a time when a, a missed shot that goes into the ground or, or beyond the target scares that threat, lets them know you're serious about defending yourself and ends the threat right there. We can't count on any of those things though. What we need to count on is each shot having some effect. And when we train, we can't train for a thousand variations because that ruins our consistency model. So when we think about someone trying to hurt us, whether they're trying to shoot us, punch us, choke us, stab us, when they're coming towards us to hurt us or they're already there presenting a threat, most of the time they're going to be squared off to us. They're going to be oriented towards us. It's part of what the body does naturally. When they are, 
that presents the target area of the high center chest consistently to us. We can plan on that being a highly probable target area for us to shoot at. When we look at the high center chest, from the front, that gives us a broad target area. From the side, the high center chest is also going to be an easily identifiable target. If you think of viewing me as a threat and I'm trying to hurt someone you care about over here, you can still see that there's a target area here that's presented. It's important to remember when we train on paper targets very often that we always see this and we start thinking about a two-dimensional presentation. But that three-dimensional presentation of coming through the body is very important to understand. So if you think of a line coming through the body this way, and a line coming through the body from the side, if each one of your rounds crosses both of those lines, you're highly likely to significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. That's an important fundamental of combat accuracy that we need to apply to all of our training. Traditionally, in a target environment, shooters will shoot at a much greater distance than the average critical incident that they're likely to need to use a firearm for defense of themselves or others in. So what we want to do is get used to shooting in that close environment because, again, it's going to help your pacing. If you shoot traditionally in your training environment at a longer distance, the balance of speed and precision requires you to slow down in order to get the effectiveness that you want. We talked earlier about what we're trying to accomplish with combat accuracy, a shot that significantly affects the target's ability to present a lethal threat. We obviously want to be able to get multiple shots there as quickly and efficiently as we can until the threat has stopped. That's going to be our goal. If we always shoot at 20, 15, 30 feet in that range, but our critical incidences are likely to be within 10 feet, we're going to shoot at a pace that is slower than that with which we can actually achieve the hits at that close distance. So for a behavioral reason, for consistency reasons, for reasons of comfort and confidence with our ability to shoot and place rounds effectively in the area we want to, we want to practice at those realistic environments in realistic situations. And I want you to come right up here to where you're going to be about six, seven feet away from the targets. We're going to maintain the same exact objective definition of what combat accuracy is. So any round inside of that center circle on these cardboard targets is going to be considered effective. Okay? That's what we want. That's our goal. Objectively, we're going into this saying a shot here is the same as a shot here is the same as a shot here. Okay? Six shots right there in six seconds is probably shooting too slow, even though that seems fast and seems like great shooting. Okay? If we can get those same six shots anywhere in the circle in four seconds, that's even better. All right, because that's two seconds this guy doesn't have to try to kill us. All right, that's what we're trying to stop. Stop him as fast as we can. Everyone grip your firearm. Go to the ready position. Make hot if you need to. Return to the ready position. Remember the fundamentals. Good grip. Thumbs not crossed. Holding the gun as high as we can. Stand by. Your command to fire will be up two to three rounds. I want you to get out of whatever pattern you may have established. Okay, don't shoot two and assess. Don't shoot one and then two quickly. Okay, I want you to shoot two or three rounds as efficiently as you can and then assess. Up! Up! Okay, if you're shot two rounds every time, start shooting three. If you shot three rounds every time, start shooting two. Mix it up. Picture a threat. When I say up, it's not, oh, I've got to shoot. It's, ah, I'm under a lethal threat. Okay? That's what I want you to envision. Envision that lethal threat. When you fired your two or three rounds, that threat has stopped. And you want to immediately go back to the ready position and assess your environment. Up! The gun should be moving minimally. Get your weight forward. Do not let the fact that we're close to the target break down your fundamentals.
the fundamentals of grip and stance are part of how we establish consistency. Now, when you're in a dynamic critical incident in a real world situation, you may or may not, you may be up on a ramp, you may be behind something, you may be on a stairwell, but as much as we can, we wanna work with what the body does naturally. What the body does naturally is get us into a crouch and get our weight forward and our hands come up to protect us. Well, that's great. Once we've recognized the threat and got into that crouch and our weight is forward, we've decided to use a firearm. Now we're gonna get our hands back out where we want it to be with our weight forward in a good 360 degree grip, fully supported weight forward. You know, the thing about shooting a firearm, if you're lining the sights up and you're just taking one shot, you can do it a lot of different ways. You could literally hold the gun upside down, shoot with your pinky. You could just be sloppy with your elbow bent, just kind of the gun canted sideways or something like that, or very loose supported. The problem is if we want to take those tight follow-up shots, that won't work because the gun's going to have too much movement and too many variables. So we want to make sure we have that good, tight 360 degree grip, grip with our thumbs layered and not crossed. We're in the ready position or we're coming from the holster and as we do and we've crouched and we've got our weight forward, we bring that gun up and extend out fully so that when we shoot, our rounds stay very close together because everything's tight, fully extended and locked out. If, on the other hand, as we extend, and too often we do this in training, whereas in a real critical incident, our body is going to put us in this situation and we're going to work with that, that crouch and forward posture. In training, if we're always like this and standing up and, well, it's just paper and I'm just trying to hit the center, that first shot may go in there, but what tends to happen is when our weight's back on our heels, the gun will move much more and spread that out. And you can see that vertical climb is typical of someone with their weight back as the gun pushes back on their body and their weight is not forward. Similarly, as we're coming from the holster, what happens all too often under critical stress, if we don't have a really tight extension parallel with our line of sight, if instead we pull the gun and we sweep it up, or we come out here and swing up, the gun may not go off exactly when we want it to, when it's in that perfect spot. So by establishing coming to the ready position, extending straight out, we have a much greater chance of hitting the center of that target. Let's take a look at the six. And if we think about coming out early and sweeping the gun, that round went clear off the paper. Even though the gun's heading towards locking in in the center of the six, I shot too early as the gun was here. Not very far, but because I wasn't extending parallel with my line of sight through that ready position, the round didn't even hit the paper. Okay, similarly, same thing can happen if we come here through the ready position and there we are off to the side. Because again, we're not fully extending that right arm. That looks good, feels good. If we were lining the sights up and taking that extra time, we could shoot with bent elbows all day. The problem is under critical incident stress, we're not gonna have that cognitive ability, especially not at the beginning of that incident. So we wanna lock that gun straight out, get those shots quickly and rapidly into the box we're looking at. The most important part of understanding combat focus shooting is understanding that our goal is efficiency. It's an efficient use of a firearm to defend ourselves or someone else. Often, Shooting is approached as a mechanical skill, and we think about target shooting and, and extreme accuracy as always being the goal. Well, that's a great skill set, and, and it's a lot of fun to do target shooting, and it's, it's important and valuable to understand how to be as accurate as we can with a firearm in certain contexts. But in the context of defensive shooting, we really want to understand that we need to stop the threat as fast as we can. The accuracy level that we need is any accuracy level that will significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat towards us or someone we're trying to defend. We call that combat accuracy. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Let's talk about efficiency, because efficiency is how we achieve combat accuracy. The idea of efficiency is to do things with as little cognitive thought and as little mechanical process as we possibly can to still achieve our goal. We get that through consistency. The fewer options we have, the more precise our movements are and the more mechanically efficient they are then the more consistent they're going to be so it's a nice little circle of consistency and efficiency taking away the number of options we have for how to present the gun we're always going to present the gun at full extension we want to present the gun as often as we can from our high compressed ready position or from our holster where we're going to carry the gun for self-defense what we want to do is always have those two be the same we carry the gun here all the time, we hold the gun here all the time, we're going to be able to extend the gun out as consistently as possible. That's going to make us more efficient.
in response to natural threats, our body and brain have evolved great defensive strategies that happen precognitively. They're actually processed by the brain when we take stimulus in, either sound or touch or sight, that startle us, that we know and that our brain recognizes as being dangerous to us, and we react to them. So that if someone were to jump out at me from the right side right now, I would probably lower my center of gravity, orient towards the threat, and bring my hands up to defend myself. All of those things are great natural reactions that will help us stay safe in the event of a close quarters ambush. We don't want to work against them. We want to work with them. And of course, by working with them, we're more efficient. Our first and primary way of defending ourselves from any threat is, of course, learning about it. The way we learn about things primarily is through sight, through our vision. So the most important thing that our brain does naturally whenever we're startled is orient towards that threat. So if we have a mechanical shooting position that allows us to be objectively more accurate, that requires us to be bladed, or requires us to close one eye, for instance, to focus on our front sight or something like that to get a more accurate shot, we're working against what the body does naturally in terms of trying to learn about that threat. After we orient towards that threat, or actually at the same time we orient towards that threat, we naturally lower our center of gravity. We get a little bend at the waist and we lower at the knees. If you think about the human body, we can't move without lowering our center of gravity. We don't stand up straight and fall and then bend our knees. We bend our knees first as we get ready to move. Anytime we're in a dynamic critical incident, we need to be able to move. If someone picks this time and place right now to try to hurt us, it's because of a perception of weakness. It's a perception that they can win. What we want to do is get off of that X, so to speak. Here's my ambush area, I'm going to move. I'm going to come over here and get out of the way. When we do that, we naturally end up in this crouching position. Even if we can't move, even if we're seated, we need to accept the reality of that crouch. So once again, if our mechanical shooting stance is up straight, knees locked, whether we can be more accurate or not really doesn't matter. Our body's putting us in this position. We need to work efficiently with it. The next thing we're going to talk about is our hands. Naturally, our body puts our hands up in front of our face. If you think about your threat, if your threat's a dog, your hands don't end up here. Your hands end up here. Think about your line of sight to any given threat. That's where your hands will end up. If someone's trying to punch you, you end up here. If someone's jumping up at you, you end up here. If something's falling on you, you end up here. That's where our body puts our hands. That's great because, of course, we want that gun in our line of sight. In fact, we want it in our line of sight and parallel with our line of sight. Hands at full extension, just like that. I'm looking through my hands and I can see my threat. I'm not focusing on my hands. I'm not focusing on the gun. This, again, works very well with what the body does naturally in terms of a defensive posture. Another thing that the brain and body do naturally in response to that dynamic critical incident situation when we're startled in order to help us learn about the threat and respond appropriately and efficiently is a situation known as tunnel vision. A lot of people think of tunnel vision as a negative thing, a loss of peripheral vision. What it actually is is an increase in the visual acuity we have in the center of our field of vision, allowing us to leave all this extraneous stuff out. We know that we've oriented directly towards that threat. When we orient towards that threat, that's what we need to be learning about. So the body does that automatically for us. It filters out all this other stuff over here. Not that it might not be important. We know that what we're looking at in the center of our field of vision is definitely important. So we, that's great. We accept it. We move through it. One of the considerations is that after we solve that problem after we've defeated that threat, after that threat has been eliminated, we need to make sure and break that tunnel vision by assessing our environment and actually looking around and seeing what else is going on. And that's going to be part of our ongoing tactical training. Remember, we're not just learning about the body. We're learning about how to apply what the body does naturally to our defensive situation. The next thing that we want to talk about is tachypsychia. Tachypsychia is the distortion of the perception of time. Technically, it could be the perception that time is speeding up or the perception that time is slowing down. Most of the time, in a dynamic critical incident, the perception is going to be that time is slowing down. Again, a great advantage for us. It's going to give us much better detail about what's going on. Think of it as a video camera that normally records at 20 frames per second, and now we're going to get 30 or 40 frames per second. And that's twice or three times as much detail coming into our brain that we're able to process and, again, figure out what to do. We want to do this as fast as we can, and our brain is helping us by speeding up that processing. The last thing that we really need to take into consideration that's going to be an important factor on the fundamentals of how we use our firearm and how we train to use our firearm is realizing that we will have a loss of fine motor skill during a dynamic critical incident. 
So if we train with our firearms with a high degree of fine motor skill using small buttons or very precise motions with safeties and slide releases and things like that, we're going to be really working against what our body can do efficiently during a dynamic critical incident. So for instance, when we talk about operating the slide of our semi-automatic firearm, sure, there's a lot of firearm designs that will allow us to hit that slide release button, but what we really want to do is do something that will work with all of the semi-automatic firearms we're going to use. And that means bringing our hand over, grabbing that slide, pulling back, and allowing it to go into battery so that we can get it done more efficiently with that loss of fine motor skill that we know is going to happen. Other factors may come up in your training that make you realize you're going to need to be able to do things as simply as you can because there's a lot going on and there's not a lot of control over those fingers and extremities to get it done. So we want to do things in a big picture way that will always be efficient. Working with what the body does naturally is incredibly important during a dynamic critical incident. It's really what allows us to be efficient and it's going to help us to survive. We're going to talk about the ready position. Before we do, obviously, in the ready position, uh, Jeremiah is going to have a gun in his hand. First thing we're going to do is go ahead and, and keep the gun pointing in a generally safe direction down at the floor and check to see that there's both nothing in the chamber and not a magazine in the gun. So there are no rounds at all in the vicinity of the gun. Jeremiah is going to check it also. This gives us our two-person safety check. He's then going to go ahead and put the slide forward, put the gun into battery, okay? And that's going to allow us to be able to realistically hold the gun and put it in that high-compressed ready position. Um, as he turns back towards the perceived threat area, keeping the gun pointed in a safe direction, he's now going to go into the high compressed ready position. Okay. The high compressed ready position, as you can see, is one that keeps the firearm oriented towards the threat, in very close towards the shooter, with the elbows at the side. Elbows at the side is incredibly important. If you look at the position I'm in now with my elbows at my side, I'm a much wider object to get around for someone behind me to try to get to or interfere with my firearm, which would be here in my hands. If my elbows were down here, it'd be much easier for somebody to reach around and grab that gun. If we take a look at where Jeremiah is and I try to come around, he's going to feel that threat as I try to come around much better than if his elbows were in front of him, tucked in, and I were able to reach around and grab the gun first. That's what we're trying to avoid. You know, it's one of the major advantages of the high compressed ready position is that it's a great retention position. By keeping the gun up high at our chest, we're able to see, even with tunnel vision, anything coming directly at the gun or feel anything coming around from our peripheral area here. The next important thing to understand about the high compressed ready position is that it works very consistently with our presentation from a holster or any other position that we may need to be in, such as a reloading position. We can do all that right here. Jeremiah goes through the motions of a reload, reaching for his magazine, coming back to the gun, racking the slide. You can see all of this can be done in that high compressed ready position. So once again, good retention. It's consistent. If he goes back to the holster, we're going to see that as he presents and reacts to a target in front of him, it comes right through that ready position as he goes to extension. That consistency with high compressed ready is incredibly important. The consistency of the high compressed ready position with everything else we're doing, of course, leads to improved efficiency. Remember, as we've been saying, the stated goal of significantly affecting the target's ability to present a lethal threat needs to be achieved as efficiently as possible. That's the backbone of the combat focused shooting program, efficiency. Consistency in our ready position, in the place where we reload, in our presentation from the holster coming through that ready position is all incredibly important. As we move through a realistic environment or we engage targets in a realistic environment, we want to have one ready position that works 98% of the time. Once we have the firearm in that high compressed ready position because of the anticipation of the need to use it to defend ourselves against a lethal threat or defend somebody else against a lethal threat, obviously the next step that's going to come should it come to the lethal defense is to extend the firearm out. When we do that, we again want to be as efficient and consistent as we can. If we take a look at the full extension of both arms, that's as consistent as it gets. There's no 10 degree bend here, 12 degree bend here, anything of this nature. It's full extension. 
go back to the ready position for a second. Let's think about the way the brain controls the muscles. We don't want the brain to have to send two messages of start and stop. What we're looking for is a biomechanical stop. The physiology of the body stops that gun's movement automatically so that as he extends, it reaches a locking point where it stops. It works very well with what the body does naturally in terms of a lowered center of gravity and our weight forward, fully extended. Notice that the gun is parallel with and in line with his line of sight. The gun's not down here pointed in a general direction. The gun's certainly not up here angled down to where he's looking through his own hands. He's looking right through the gun, parallel with his line of sight and in his line of sight. Back to the ready position and extend. Notice that the final motion of the gun is out towards the target. From the ready position, you could conceivably bring the gun straight out from the chest and then swing it up. Well, once again, when we swing, we see that there is no biomechanical lock here. There's no stop. So we end up with momentum or inertia. And that gun, we have to then tell a message from our brain to the muscles, stop the motion of the gun. Instead, if the gun goes from the ready position, comes up into the line of sight as it's extending out, biomechanical lock. It's the most efficient and consistent way to get that gun out towards the target. With this particular firearm, as the gun goes back and forth, we don't have to do anything. The gun goes all the way out. If we've decided to shoot, we're then going to touch the trigger, and we would slowly, smoothly press the trigger in the event we were ready to fire. The gun goes back in with our finger off the trigger, and we're now going to assess the environment and see what else we may need to do. With other types of firearms, there's got to be an important concept of understanding the safety or the decocking mechanism on that gun and where to employ it. Once again, we want to employ it as consistently as possible. This is a single action firearm with a external manually operated safety that has to come off before I'm going to engage the trigger. If my perceived thread is out in front of me, I've got my two-handed grip, I'm in my high compressed ready position. As I extend the gun, there's going to be an imaginary plane somewhere that is consistent so that as I go out, I click that safety off I would engage the target if appropriate, and as the gun comes back in, I'm going to put that safety back on at exactly the same place. If this were a double single action gun, I would do exactly the same thing. As the gun goes out, I would do nothing. I would just extend, take my double action shots, followed by single action shots if appropriate, and as the gun came back in, I would then manipulate that decocker to make sure that the gun goes back into double action mode. I want the gun in double action mode or I want the safety on on a single action type gun from the ready position every time because that's the most consistent. Let's look at another aspect of consistency for the high compressed ready and the full extension presentation combination. Jeremiah goes back to his holster. We're going to see that as he responds to a threat, reaches for his firearm, brings the gun out to extend it, it goes through that high compressed ready position once again. As he extends out towards the target, he can come back into the high compressed ready, assess the environment, see if there's anything else he might need to do, and then reholster at the end of his dynamic critical incident. Balance of speed and precision is a component of all of our shooting. There's always going to be some balance between how fast we can get the hit that we need to get in terms of speed and precision. The conditions under which we shoot, that moment, the target and the circumstances are what dictate our need for precision. The relationship between the target dictating the need for precision and our skill dictating whether or not we get that hit is all based on the speed with which we shoot, assuming all of our fundamentals are in place. We're going to talk about stance and grip, presentation, all those important fundamentals of shooting. But the speed with which we execute those is really based on our confidence and our belief in our ability. The targets behind me have colored shapes with numbers in it. What we're going to do is call out numbers. All of a sudden, your target area is going to be less predictable than it was before. Now, certainly, Okay, this is your target area. You're going to be in the ready position. It's still a rather sterile controlled drill, but there is going to be a little deviation into what your actual target is. As you're sidestepping and recognizing that target, you're going to punch the gun straight out into your line of sight parallel to that threat. If I call three, three is your threat. Four, four is your threat. We're going to be looking at the end of this drill at the balance between speed and precision. Your precision need 
is going to remain constant. Something else is actually going to change in the middle of the drill. When that changes, it may change the speed with which you can attain that group. Okay, that's what we're going to work on now, is how the distance or the relative size of a target affects our speed. Nothing changes about what objective we want to accomplish. We want to get the shots in the colors. We want the holes to be in the colors or very close proximity to the color. Okay, that's our goal. How fast you can do that is what we're going to be looking at. You decide through empirical evidence how fast you can get that shot. Make sure you're at full extension, good consistent position, focused on the threat that I call. We're going to continue to sidestep on presentation. We're going to continue to sidestep on our reload to significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat using our environment. We're going to use our tool, the firearm, in our training to get those combat accurate hits. Grip your firearm and go to the ready position. Make hot if you need to in the ready position. Stand by. Two or three rounds. Two or three rounds. At the number, the shape that contains the number that I call as your threat, sidestepping to the right first. Stand by. Five. If you're out, if you're significantly out of the color, slow down. If your shots are in the same hole, speed up. Use the maximum area for combat effectiveness that we'd identified. Three. Holster. We're going to look at the balance between speed and precision using one of these SEB targets. It gives us multiple target areas of different sizes. The other nice thing about this drill that you can do with your training partner to learn your balance between speed and precision without needing to increase your distance or change anything dramatically is that the up commands or the standard firing command that gets you into that, that high center chest area, the box on the SEB, is going to be much more predictable and, and obviously behaviorally more expected than the number call. Your training partner also has the option of calling a number which is inside of a shape on the target which is going to cause a deviation in that standard presentation. Just that little bit of change is going to obviously require a longer duration of presentation because you have to find and acquire the target. It's not coming straight out into the center mass of that bowling pin. So for a couple of different reasons, both the smaller target area and the less predictable nature of the target area, it's going to require a more precise shot, which means our speed is not going to be as attainable as it is when we have that larger surface area to get two or three shots into to significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. So the drill is on a standard command which we'll use up, two or three rounds will be fired into the high center chest attempting to significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. On a number call, we're going to fire one round into the smaller target area and we're going to look at the difference between the speed with which we can attain those rapid shots into the large area versus the precise shot into the small area. Mike's going to call for me. I'll be standing by in a nonviolent posture. So you can see there, what I did was rush that shot and try to take it at exactly the same amount of time that I was taking that center mass shot, which is a much larger target area. And while that shot would have been within the large box, it's clearly not within that smaller surface area. That's what happens when you don't respect the balance between speed and precision. Remember, objectively, the area we want to hit, high center chest, doesn't change. Just because you're 30 feet away or 40 feet away or 50 feet away, maybe you shouldn't be shooting a pistol. You can't say, well, gee, I hit one out of 10 shots. That's okay. That's not acceptable. Okay? Whatever your level of acceptable consistency was when you were at this 8, 10 foot range is exactly the same level of consistency and combat accuracy you should be satisfied with at that 20 foot range. What does that mean? It means you have to slow down. It means you have to concentrate more means you have to be more consistent in your fundamentals, smoother in your trigger pull, more determined in your extension, weight forward, controlling that gun, especially for the follow-up shots. Because it's not acceptable to be able to come into a target area. Let me find a, a target that exemplifies. Okay? This is perfect. Look at this. 
Good hits on the five, good hits on the three, good hits on the two. Then all of a sudden we went back to 20 feet and we have no hits on the six, no hits on the four. Okay, too fast. We're just shooting too fast here. We're capable of being combat accurate, but we went too fast and we weren't able to do it. Okay, similarly, we can look at a target like this. Look at this big tight group here on the five, great tight group on the one, great tight group on the two, great tight group on the three. Then we look at the six and the four, and what do we see? We see combat accurate groups. Okay, these are acceptable groups. So apparently we were too, shooting too slow when we were in here. Okay, so it works both ways. This drill will allow you to look at your balance between speed and precision. If this is an acceptable group size, and you can do this at 20 feet, you should be able to shoot much, much faster at five. So it's possible that this was a pacing issue. We shot exactly the same way, but when we expanded our distance, it expanded our group. Okay, so we want to pick up the pace here and shoot even faster to take maximum advantage of that combat accurate area. Because this is a great drill you can take home, do this on a square range anywhere to help you balance speed and precision, be able to determine whether or not you can shoot as fast as you want to and figure out your pacing at any given distance so that you're aware of it and that you will then recognize the pacing with which you need to shoot given a target size or a distance or a dynamic environment reality. Understanding that the correlation between our belief in our ability and our actual ability is going to be more accurate if we train more realistically and train more often is incredibly important as we move forward in the combat focused shooting program. That correlation strengthens when we shoot realistically. If we require ourselves, for example, to shoot at an extreme accuracy level, always wanting to put each bullet right next to the other one in the very center of that target, we're going to be confident in our ability to do that in a very mechanical way. But that's not the need that we actually have in a dynamic critical incident. By training as realistically as we can, preferably with reactive targets, three-dimensional targets, in a realistic environment with all the real distractions that we can incorporate into our training that will be there in a real dynamic critical incident, our correlation and our belief in our ability to shoot as fast as we can or as slowly as we need to is going to be more accurate. The balance of speed and precision is an incredibly important concept. The better the correlation between our ability and our belief in our ability, the more efficient we're going to be because the more intuitively we can react to the needs of a dynamic critical situation. Before we talk about the four fundamental factors that actually affect that balance between speed and precision, it's important to understand the concept of deviation. Deviation is the difference between where the muzzle is pointed at the exact moment that the bullet exits the barrel and where you wanted it to be pointed in order to hit the exact area that you wanted in order to be combat accurate. There's always going to be some measure of deviation. It might be induced by your movement, it might be induced by movement of the target, it might be induced by bad trigger control, bad recoil management. So we know deviation is going to be there. All of our shooting, our combat focus shooting fundamentals are designed to reduce deviation. Our presentation, our extension, the grip on the gun, our effort to focus on trigger control as touching the trigger and then pressing the trigger, all of those things will reduce deviation. All the situations you're going to shoot in during a defensive situation will accept a certain amount of deviation, but you want to limit it. The way you limit it is through consistency and efficiency and working with what the body does naturally. Think of deviation as a cone extending out from the muzzle. That cone can be certain size and still achieve combat accurate hits. To think of a bullet coming out of that muzzle as a laser shot going straight directly where you wanted it is really expecting too much in a dynamic critical incident. So understand that that cone is going to exist. Limiting that cone is a matter of consistency and efficiency and following the combat focused shooting fundamentals and working with what your body does naturally. Limiting deviation is incredibly important to efficient shooting.
The four fundamentals that affect the balance between speed and precision are incredibly important. They're the things that actually dictate the need for precision from the target or the environment or the conditions under which you're shooting. They are distance to the target, the size of the target, the circumstances under which you shoot, and your anticipation of the need to shoot right before you have to. Distance to the target magnifies deviation. Obviously, if we go back to that model of the cone coming out from the muzzle of that firearm as you extend it, touch the trigger, press the trigger, that cone, the end of it gets larger the further away you get from the muzzle. So we're not talking about the perceived distance to the target. The real distance to the target actually magnifies the effects of deviation. You might be able to have one or two or three degrees of deviation at a target at 10 feet, but if that target's 20 feet away, that might cause a miss. So distance to target is the first and most fundamental reason to limit your deviation. The size of the target also relates to deviation. The bigger the target is, the more deviation it will accept and still allow you to achieve a combat accurate hit. If you have an area you need to hit that's 24 inches wide, you can have a given amount of deviation that you could not have with a target that was much smaller, 10 or 12 inches. If we think about a lot of different scenarios, we can come up with reasons why the target wouldn't be as big as you normally think it is. For example, right now, as I face you, if I was your threat, my upper chest area, the high center chest, combat accurate area that we're going to train for, is as wide as it is. But if I turn and you're shooting in defense of someone else that I might be attacking over here, you can see that that target just got smaller. Nothing else changed about the situation. Whatever distractions or lighting or movement there may have been, that's all the same. What changed was the size of the target and the amount of deviation it would accept from you as you try to end this dynamic critical incident. The third factor that affects the balance between speed and precision is the conditions under which you shoot. Now that's a large factor. And really what we're talking about is lighting, movement, distraction, the perceived penalty for a miss. Picture a guy who's trying to hurt you or someone you care about standing in front of a brick wall with a gun in his hand and he's about to try to hurt you. Your perceived penalty for missing that person may be very, very low. Put that same bad guy in front of a schoolyard full of children and you might perceive a much greater penalty for a miss. Naturally, when we shoot, we always want to hit our target and we're always responsible for those rounds. But I promise you, if you're in a real critical incident and you've got a bad guy standing in a crowded mall, you're going to shoot slower than you would if he was standing in front of that brick wall. And that's an effect on the balance between speed and precision. Incorporating that concept into your training is incredibly important. The conditions under which you shoot, whether or not you can see the target clearly, target identification, the background, bystanders, movement, the firearm you're using. Maybe you just got it yesterday. Maybe you haven't been practicing with it. Or maybe it's one you practice with all the time and you're very, very comfortable with. All of those conditions affect the balance between speed and precision. The fourth factor really relates to human behavior, and that's the anticipation of your need to shoot just before you recognize the need to shoot. We talk a lot about awareness and recognition. All of our training should be designed to raise our awareness so that we recognize a dynamic critical incident and the appropriate response as fast as possible. Part of that awareness is a conditioning to expect certain things. If you're standing and there's two guys in front of you, both of whom are threatening you, but one of them has a knife, you're naturally going to be focusing on that person with the obvious weapon. Your anticipation of the need to defend yourself and perhaps use a firearm to do so and shoot that person is going to be much higher than it is for his buddy standing next to him. But if that same guy were to reach under his shirt, pull out a firearm and present it towards you, naturally you would recognize the need to shoot him. However, because of your anticipation being lower, it will take you more time than if the guy with the knife were to charge towards you. The anticipation of the need to shoot is a behavioral factor that it's awfully hard to overcome, but it's very important to recognize. The idea being here, the more ready you are or the more aware you are of your need to defend yourself, the faster you're going to shoot. Keep your awareness high and always be thinking about what could happen and what you're going to need to respond to in a realistic environment. Once you look at the four factors that affect the balance of speed and precision and the amount of deviation you're putting into the equation, you realize pretty quickly that you need to limit that deviation. The way you do that is through your fundamentals and good practice, and then the application of those fundamentals in a realistic way. 
Think of the analogy of a race car driver on a track trying to get the fastest lap time possible. If he goes around a corner and screeches his tires and starts sliding, he knows he's not being efficient. He's got to find a better line, a better way to get around that corner. Eventually, he's going to find the best line and the best way to get around that corner. When he does so, if the tires are still squealing, he's just going too fast. In your shooting, once you've got a great grip, you've got an efficient extension, you're in the right body position and stance, you've got a gun that works for you and you're managing your recoil well, you've got good trigger control, you might find out that you're just shooting too fast if you're not getting combat accurate hits. That's those tires squealing. In training, it's incredibly important to do that, to push yourself, to make those tires squeal, to miss the target in training so you know how fast you can shoot. If you always stay in a safe zone where you're always getting hits, you may not know how fast you can shoot. We've got my student here. And what we're going to do is take a look at how we go from a normal standing position and get into that good shooting stance. The truth is, stance is a matter of convenience. If you have a firearm and you keep it fully extended, parallel with your line of sight and in your line of sight, keep the orientation of the firearm consistent with the orientation of your head, it doesn't matter if you're laying down, sitting down, falling down while you're shooting. Stance is a matter of convenience. But as long as we have the opportunity, we want it to be consistent and efficient with what the body does naturally. What we're going to do is imagine that there's a threat directly in front of Jeremiah. As he recognizes that threat, his body is going to do all those things we talked about it doing naturally. He's going to orient towards it if he wasn't already. In other words, he's going to get better focus on it so that he can see and learn about that threat immediately and quickly to be able to respond appropriately. His hands are going to come up as his center of gravity lowers. The Lowering of the center of gravity primarily will happen at the knees, but it also is a function of the waist. So when we're in that natural, neutral position with our feet parallel under our shoulders, we're about shoulder width apart, here, here, wherever. We don't want to be exaggerated really wide where we're not able to move as freely. We don't want to be really narrow where we don't have as good balance. Just a natural position with our feet approximately shoulder width apart for training, because in the real world, it's going to be wherever they end up. When his center of gravity lowers, his shoulders are no longer over his hips. They're out over his knees or his toes. That's the position that we're going to want to be in when we're responding to a threat because it's the position that A, our body puts us in naturally, and B, allows us to move. Again, we have to lower our center of gravity in order to be able to move. From this position, that natural extension of the firearm continues as his arms come out to keep his body position with his weight forward. That's going to give us better recoil management. So this is really the stance at its most simple. If we look at the feet, they're oriented towards the threat, just like our body is going to be. They're, they are parallel. They're not staggered, because if we believe we have to shoot in a staggered position, if you'll just kick one foot back or another, if we believe that we have to shoot, we talked about the correlation between our beliefs and our speed during the balance of speed and precision. Same thing. If he thinks he needs his feet to be staggered, he's going to hesitate if his feet aren't staggered. And we talked about stance being a matter of convenience. So we're going to start from a neutral stance and a natural stance, which is oriented towards the threat with his feet parallel, knees bent, weight forward at the waist. That allows him to be in a position to fight. He's going to be able to extend his firearm straight out from that ready position and get good combat accurate hits in a way that works naturally with the body. We talked a lot about lateral movement relative to the target. It's important that we see a live demonstration of exactly what that means and how it really helps you. Obviously from a presentation, whether you're in the ready or you're obviously going to be more likely to be from a holster, there's a delay between the time you recognize a threat to the time that you can respond appropriately and efficiently to get those combat accurate hits. What One of the things we can do during that lag time between recognition and response is to move laterally relative to the target to make it harder for that other person with the firearm to hit us. If, for instance, I were to walk into my kitchen and find a home intruder with a firearm pointed at me, and all I were to do were orient towards the threat, draw, and shoot, that person has all this time to shoot at me while I'm doing that. Instead, what I want to do 
is recognize the attack. The, obviously, the gun's pointed out at me as I recognize it. Now, at this point, if I move laterally as I draw and extend, it's much harder for that person to hit me. When we draw and extend towards a target and then try to track laterally, we have that momentum. And it's much harder to get on target than it is if we were to identify and extend out. So by pointing the gun out at you, that home intruder has already chosen to engage. The best thing and the most important thing that you can do while responding with your firearm is to do that recognition of the attack and then lateral movement as you respond, causing him to have to shift his point of aim to the left or right. So we're gonna be in the ready position. I'm gonna give you your command to fire. You're gonna recognize your threat, which is gonna be the target in front of you. You're gonna realize that what you need to do is to get multiple hits in that high center chest area to stop the threat. While we're doing that, we're gonna move. So on recognition, you're going to now start sidestepping. Okay, we're, on, we're in close quarters. This is a new skill. We're moving to another level. For safety's sake, we're going to alternate left and right. First time you're gonna go right, second time you're gonna go left, you're gonna move as a group. So your command to fire will be up. You'll recognize your attack, move to the right, take your shots. Okay. We'll be here, up. Come back into the ready position, stand by. The next command to fire, up. We're gonna move as we present. We should be planted a full body width offline, significantly affecting that target's ability to present a lethal threat before we engage. Grip your firearm and go to the ready position. Muzzle depressed, high at your chest. Stand by for your command to fire. You're going to sidestep to the right. Is everybody hot? Stand by. Up! Up! I have an inert demonstrator gun here. It's a solid piece of plastic. I use it to talk a little bit about grip. The idea of, of a good grip on a firearm, uh, defensive shooting, target shooting, any good grip, is really all about getting as much contact with the firearm as we can. What we want to do is get as much of a 360 degree contact around that grip area with one hand, if that's all we have, preferably with two hands, maximizing our contact area, keeping that grip as high as we can. So remember, with a real gun, the action of a semi-automatic pistol is going to be up here. With a revolver, generally where we grip the gun is also below the area where the recoil is going to be generated. So if we hold the gun very low, as that slide comes back or as that recoil is generated by the firearm, we end up with a gun that flops around a great deal. Instead, we're going to hold the gun up as high as we can. When we do that, it naturally puts our trigger finger up in that position up here on the frame where we want it until we are ready to shoot. It allows us to wrap our other fingers around the gun up as high as we can against that trigger guard. In the back, of course, right here in the web of our hand, it's up high on the grip, as high as it can be, without interfering with the action of a semi-automatic pistol or coming up over the top of a revolver. I'm going to have Jeremiah join us now in this demonstration with his firearm. As he comes through the ready position and extends one-handed grip first, what you'll see is that his thumb is high, creating a gap here. That gap is exactly where we want to lay the meat of the other hand in against the gun so that our thumbs are layered. What you're seeing here is the maximum amount of contact possible. If the thumbs were crossed in any way, for instance underneath, now all of a sudden there's a big gap in here but underneath of this hand where it's being pushed off of the gun. If we rotate the gun a little bit this way, you can see how that pushes that support hand off the gun rotate the thumbs around and cross them the other way and once again it pulls this hand down we we'll rotate the gun back up and you can see it gives us doesn't give us as much support up here on the top of the gun as we'd like to have so we're going to go back to the proper grip which is layered thumbs the fingers wrap around the front if you'll remove again and come back up placing it in the fingers wrap around the front 
parallel with the existing fingers on the hand. So that as the support hand comes in, it's again high up against the trigger guard, and we have those fingers wrap around just like that. Guns in the high compressed ready, guns out extended, one-handed grip while we're doing reloads and everything else, back to the ready position, that's where we want to be. It's also important to note that when we're going to the holster, when we reach down to initiate that holster presentation, we get as much of that good firing grip as we can. Fingers wrapped around, gun held high in the web of the hand, trigger finger already placed where it's going to be on the frame when that gun comes up out of the holster, so that we're naturally in this position as we come through the ready position and into our extension. Back to the ready position and then back into the holster. Go through that entire process now, Jeremiah. We're going to react to a threat. He's going to reach back, get as much of his good firing grip as he can, come up through the ready position where it becomes a two-handed supported grip and extend parallel with and in his line of sight. That's the good grip for efficient recoil management and efficient use of the combat focus shooting principles to get combat accurate hits and end your critical dynamic incident as fast as possible. We've gotten some live ammunition and obviously our hearing and eye protection. What we're going to do now is actually put this all together and talk a little bit about trigger control. So what you're going to look for when we're shooting, or when Jeremiah is shooting at these targets, really is, is not what's going on downrange, but what's going on with the shooter. How is he working to be as efficient as he can be, to be as consistent as he can be, and to work well with what his body will do naturally anyway during a dynamic critical incident. Now, it's important to do this as consistently as you can. Even though this is an administrative function at this point, notice that Jeremiah is doing it in the high compressed ready, and he's doing it in an effective, efficient combat way, using gross motor skills, trying to train his body to always do it one way. That's consistency, and of course that makes him more efficient. We're going to start in that ready position. So we had a little bit of a warning. We knew that it might come to using lethal force to defend ourselves or somebody else. And now as he recognizes his threat, he's already in his stance. You can see his weight's forward, his knees are bent, he's lowered his center of gravity. He's oriented towards the threat. Obviously now he's recognized the need to shoot. And we're going to go through a drill we call extend, touch, press. It's a very simple drill. It reinforces the idea that there are three distinct movements to the presentation and firing of the gun towards the threat. We've recognized the threat. He's going to extend, touch the trigger, and then slowly, smoothly pull the trigger. As he does that, he's constantly assessing the environment. He brings the gun back in, finger off the trigger, obviously. At this point, he's assessing again whether or not he needs to shoot. And we go through that again. We've recognized the need to shoot. He extends, touches, and presses. Bring the gun back in. If we were going to do a multiple shot string, He'd simply keep good trigger control contact with his finger. He's going to fire the gun, release the trigger as far forward as he needs to, let the gun reset, and then press the trigger again, and press until the threat has stopped. It's important in training to be able to work that into your training model. We can't predict how many shots it'll take to stop your next threat during your critical incident. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell the student, I'm going to give you one command to fire. Jeremiah, I'm going to say up. When I say up, he's going to extend, touch, and press on his own, and he's going to fire two or three rounds, mixing it up every time, envisioning a threat, and then envisioning the cessation of that threat so that he can come back to the ready position and assess his environment. Note that his trigger finger won't go to the trigger until he's at extension, and it'll come off the trigger and go back into a safe position on the frame before he comes back in to the ready position. Stand by. Notice that his body doesn't relax. If he were to reholster right now, he's going to do so in his ready position. And then he's going to stand up and get out of that crouched ready position. It's important to do that in your training. Too often I see people extend and shoot in their ready position, from their ready position, from their good combat stance, and then relax after they're done shooting and reholster in a very administrative, static range way. And that's not good training. It's inconsistent and therefore inefficient. Again, from the ready position, So there you have it, the fundamentals of the combat focused shooting program. 
Combat focus shooting is a program designed to work well with what we know your body's going to do naturally during a dynamic critical incident and make you more efficient by increasing your ability to react intuitively once you've recognized the need to react to a lethal threat while you have a firearm on. You know, this program has been taught to law enforcement officers, military special operations personnel, people just like yourselves, all with the goal of making them safer, making them better able to react in a realistic situation in a practical way. You may be able to become a more accurate shooter using other more mechanical principles, but you don't need to be that accurate in a dynamic critical incident. You only need to be accurate enough. We talked about combat accuracy and the way that we want to use combat accuracy to significantly affect the target's ability to present a lethal threat. Figuring out how fast you can do that, knowing your balance of speed and precision is incredibly important. You can take what you've learned in this video and what you've seen now and apply it in a variety of different training environments and hopefully you'll never have to apply it in the real world, but if you do, You'll be able to do it that much faster, that much more intuitively after being exposed to combat-focused shooting. There are certified instructors all over the country. Military units and law enforcement agencies have adopted the combat-focused shooting program because it works. Thanks for watching this edition of the Valhalla Personal Firearm Defense DVD series. Practice the tactics and training drills you've just learned at your favorite shooting range and you're going to gain the confidence and skills you need to effectively protect yourself with your firearm. Remember to check and understand the firearm laws in your area, especially as they relate to personal protection and concealed carry. See you next time.